Neil Gaiman's The Sandman is now streaming on Netflix as a television series with a fully cinematic score. I'm Colleen Phelps. In this look behind the playlist, composer David Buckley takes us from the land of dreams to a very scary diner. I was trying to come up with a metaphor for scoring a series like this that goes to so many places. And the best metaphor I could come up with was that you had to create a bolt of fabric that could be made into a dress or curtains or a tablecloth and really just be anything but still be the same fabric. Is that an accurate description of what it was like? Yes. Yeah. I mean, you, you, that's the most eloquent way. I, someone's asked me a similar sort of question. I think I've, I've, I've stumbled trying to find the right words, but I think you, you've hit it in a nutshell. Yeah. I mean, it's the, the key to, to this show is because it's so eclectic, it's so varied, it moves around. It's, you have, you know, you have to be responsive as a composer to that. You can't, you, you know, you have to look at, here we are in this episode, here we are in this episode, here we are in this episode. But you also, simultaneously to being sympathetic to wherever you might be, you have to kind of keep some consistency and let it feel as if it's still, you know, it has a shared DNA. Um, otherwise, otherwise, I don't think it would be as successful. I think, and I think that was just, I think that was one of the big hurdles that I had to get over, which was that there was this, it's so different to a, to other shows that I've worked on, other shows I've watched where, you know, you set a sort of tone at the beginning and you pretty much, I'm not saying you don't deviate that from that in any way, but it it's kind of, you know, the, the trajectory is fairly straightforward. This was not straightforward. Certainly the first seven episodes or first six episodes and then the seven to 10 feel like their own kind of breakaway little kind of storyline. They all have such a sort of unique uh, dramatic perspective that it, it requires some quite sort of nimble nimble scoring and, and being able to kind of move quite times quite boldly from sort of you know full-on horror to absolute sweet cuteness um you know like with the little Gregory the little gargoyle for example the world of the Sandman is so well established and especially since these are you know, done with graphics, right? So the audience has the story in mind if they've read it before and they, if they've read it, they also have a visual in mind. Has, does having that much of it established and existing make it easier or harder to sort of come in and create the musical world? Well, <clears throat> firstly, I, I, I didn't sort of, it's only really in the run up to the show being released where I really got a sense of how much this means to people and um, what, you know, people who've read the comics, people who've sort of waited in with anticipation for decades for some kind of new manifestation of the comics to come to life. So I didn't, it's not to say that I didn't know that there were people who read the comics and I didn't know that this show had been in pre-production hell for a couple of decades. It's more that I, I just didn't obsess about it. And I think probably to my benefit because, you know, already in a show like this, I'm, I'm, I'm trying to please a lot of masters. I mean, Neil obviously being primary amongst those, but lots of executives at Warner Brothers, Netflix. Um, and to have the weight of thinking there's a whole fan base out there who are, you know, going to curse my name or, or or celebrate my name, depending on what whatever success they think I found in this. I'm glad. I'm just glad my mind didn't go there. Um, I don't think. I don't know really if it could have helped me. One of the reasons it couldn't help me is because when I started the project, I I did read the comics and the showrunner Alan Heinberg shared a digital version of them with me, and I did read them and I did embrace the source material and Neil's you know original concept, but. You know, we were we were making this for a new medium. We weren't. I wasn't writing music for a comic book. I was writing music for a television show. Uh, Neil was, you know, heavily involved in the show, so his vision is still very clear and very present. But it has to have moved in a different direction for where the comics comics were living. So, and also, you know, I'm also thinking of this. This isn't just intended for people who read the comics. This is intended as equally for people who have no initiation into this world and who want to come to it fresh. I mean, 
my 80 year old mum is watching it. I just, I just funny enough, it's, I, I can't think of a project that I've done where more people have come out of the woodwork and sent me an email saying, hey, I just watched Simon, I saw you did the music. I literally, just before you called, someone who I went to university with who I haven't spoken to for two decades contacted me. Um, someone, a colleague of mine who I used to teach with, who I didn't, you know, I'm not saying I forgot about, them. I didn't think they were dead or anything, but I just hadn't given them a second thought. They just came up. So I think it has a broad um, audience base here. Um, so from that point of view, my relative naivety about the subject matter, I don't think was a disservice. Personally, I don't think it was a disservice to, to, to whatever I may have achieved. But some of these characters are very familiar to classical music, like Lucifer could have had tritones all over the place and death mm. could have had the DS array. Did you consciously at some point mm -hmm. say, I'm going to avoid all of those tropes? Well, death is an easy one because the, the vision of death in this show is one of I mean, it's it's sort of death's warm embrace. It's it's gorgeous. It's frankly how anyone I personally think if I wouldn't mind when I go having someone like that come and help me into whatever's next. Personally, I don't think there's a whole lot next, but that's a different conversation. Um, but I love the fact that we were treating death as this thing of beauty, as you know, and that isn't that that isn't a stock. I even think that maybe it was an early question of mine. You know, do we want to bring any sense of kind of slight more angst or 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 um, you know pain or anguish to the notion of death? And it was no, 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 no. This is about beauty. This is about absolute rapture. And I thought, wow, okay, I love this show. I love this. I love these sentiments. I love this. And likewise with 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 um, Lucifer Morningstar. I mean, she's, you know, for a start, it's a female personification of of the devil, which is normally a male territory. Not normally a male version of that figure exists. And she looks like something out of a pre-Raphaelite painting. Um, and there's, you know, there's that fantastic moment in episode four when they're playing the world's oldest game. And it's, I mean, the music's a little bit more edgy in there, but never did I think I need to paint Lucifer as a, I want to think more of her as, the, as exactly what Lucifer is, a fallen angel, um, as opposed to someone who's, you know, the, anything associated with the, as you said, the tropes of the satanic kind of things that we we, we know, just, it just, the show's more complicated than that. The show's kind of better than that. And and the characters are often, um, you know, even Dream, our main protagonist, he's he's a tricky one to pin down. I mean, I, there's moments in it, well, I certainly remember my first watch through, you know, moments where I thought, I don't like this bloody guy. Um, you know, he's he's kind of mean and nasty to people. Um, and then there's moments when I feel like intense sympathy with 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 his predicament, almost like you know, almost like a member of the well, not any member of the royal family, like the queen. Like you can't the queen of England. You sort of feel, you know, she's got all this privilege and she's got like billions, billions, whatever of pounds. But but what a job! I mean, what a weight to carry on her shoulders. And I sort of think dreams like the same. You know, it's got this her, this you know being in you know everyone's thoughts and nightmares and dreams being part of his existence. So um, I like the fact that the characters are complex and have this depth. Uh, the Corinthian is complex and has, de you know, he's desperate to be human and know what it's like to be human. All the characters, I think, feel fresh in the show. Um, that's certainly how they they popped out of the, the, the screen to me. While those lines are blurred and all those characters are complex actors often say it's more fun to play a villain than a hero and there are some characters doing really good things and some characters doing really bad things in the show which is more fun to compose for well i loved the i mean i love because i just love the episode with john d in, in, in the diner um i mean that is an exceptional piece of television i think the guardian because of course i read all the reviews the guardian described it as i think the, the single best out of television so far this year um now i'm actually fairly minimal musically in that episode um until the end until dream appears at the end where i where the music asserts itself a lot more and morpheus's theme comes back um but for the bulk of that episode i am 
sliding, creeping, slithering, kind of unsettled sound design. I'm not, I don't need to be, I don't need anyone to say, oh, well, where is the tune in that? There isn't a tune. That's not a tuneful experience, what's happening in that diner. That's kind of, may that's that's just, you know, a spiral of mayhem. Um, and I and I I sort of enjoyed it for, for for being that compared you know where we go next oh no well, episode six next I'm you know that I'm big melodic there that's death and that's all the the stuff where we go back in time with our you know to London pubs that's a lot more kind of melodic driven five was 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 an exercise in 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 I just call it music call it sound design call it whatever you want call it something that you don't necessarily hear but you feel. Um, and so I enjoyed, but Jesus, I mean, with an actor like that, I don't have to do a whole lot. Um, you know, he was killing it. And um, if I could just add this slightly surreal layer of, of ill ease and, and, and just making you feel a little bit increasingly queasy that this is all going to go horribly wrong. So I, I, I mean, yes, I enjoyed that, but I keep coming back to that death because I do. I mean, that is probably one of my favorite episodes of the, the, the death stuff. But I also, I mean, but then again, the cuteness of well, I know Cain and Abel are sort of like, they're not cute at times, but their the, their passion for for for, for Gregory. Um, I don't. I mean, it's all fun. It's all fun. But what what I liked across the board in the show was that. I found that I I seem to be giving license to write music, which I would broadly consider myself, just if I was being analytical, I clearly know that you're it's a, a musical analyst because you've used the word tritone and diacere in our first couple of minutes of talking. But I tried to write something that was um, beautiful. I was trying to write beautiful music. All, and when I say beautiful, I don't mean necessarily pretty, and the beauty can have decay in it and and sorrow and melancholy. But I was just trying to write things that were beautiful and had and help people feel things um, without telling you exactly what to feel. So speaking of the themes for the individual characters, let's talk a little bit about Morpheus. And I almost, you said I am fairly analytical with music. I wanna know if I was right. What are the instruments? that really portray his theme? Well, there's two components to, to dream. There's the dreaming, mm -hmm. and that sound is often associated with a celeste. So the very first thing you hear in the show, and actually I think it's the very first thing you hear on the soundtrack album, is a celeste, but it's, I recorded it, and then I did something that a celeste cannot do, which is pitch bends, basically, it wavers. And I mean, it's, physically impossible for us. I mean, even if you tried to, like you could do it with a timpani, you can detune a timpani and you can sort of whine, but I, I don't, I don't think it would be possible to do that at all with a, with a live Celeste, unless I'm, well, you thought, may have. I thought if it was acoustic, it would have been a bell being lowered into water. Ah, then, right. Okay. But I, yes. It was, that it was is... so smoothly done. I, yeah, that's. Yeah. I mean, this was when I, this, in many ways, those two, so it's, you know, it moves from C minor to A major back to C minor. And I was thinking to myself, well, for a start, I quite like that. I like that movement. I just, I've always been quite a fan of, of sort of third related harmonies. I mean, we're now going down music analysis path. So if, if, if you're, <laughs> um, apologies to anyone who doesn't want to do this, but, um, but then I had to pose the, then I had to ask myself the question, um, where where am I in the sort of scale of being traditional, being un you, you know being non traditional? What do any of these words really mean in any case? And you know, I think there were quite a lot of executives who were sort of starting to talk about how far we should be pushing the orchestra, how far we should be pushing electronic elements. I mean, standard beginning of television show kind of committee. Everyone's everyone's got something to say. Some of the things being said are more useful to action than other things but obviously I'm 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 the new kid here so I can't I you know I can't throw my weight around too much but there no there broadly speaking there were some interesting and thought provoking comments and and I thought what I wanted to use I liked I like the celeste it's not an instrument I've used a hell of a lot um 
but I want to try and do something a bit odd with it. Something, but not, I didn't want to put it through a distortion unit. I mean, I often read about composers saying, you know, we record an orchestra and we put it through like this massive, like electric guitar cabinet. And I'm thinking, well, that just sounds like an electric guitar, actually. I've lost all sense of character of what, what your instrument is. Frankly, I didn't even know there was a bloody orchestra playing after what you've done to it. I wanted to keep the human real aspect of it but I wanted to have the surreal, surreal aspect happening concurrently. And that's really what I was striving for throughout the score, was keeping the the, the traditional, the orchestra, the thing, the, those things that are sort of timeless, no pun intended, and or endless, um, and, and then things that warp and spin and just kind of subtly kind of play on, on, on almost at the back of your mind as opposed to hitting you in, in, in the face. So that those bells are sort of that. It's the dreaming, this slightly odd, odd place. And then Morpheus's theme, well, it lives in multiple instruments, but it probably, if I was saying it's purest form, and probably where we hear it most in episode one, it's actually a combination of two instruments. There's viola de gamba and then an analog synth doubling it up. Um, and I liked the fact that the two instruments actually had to me sounded kind, there was a similarity between the two. Um, and I liked the combo and I also liked it sort of philosophically, this sort of ancient sounding thing on the one hand, and then this more modern sounding thing on the other hand. And then at any given moment, I could kind of ride one element up higher than the other. And yeah, I just, I, I, I like that combination of old and new. In fact, I mean, in many ways, that's, that's a big part of, I'd say my writing, not just in the Sandman, but all over the place. I'm, I'm sort of fascinated with ancient music. It's a big series with a lot of settings. And then each episode is so different in its setting, like you said, until you get to about seven and then they kind of come together. How many hours of music would you say you produced for it? Uh, well, when I cut the soundtrack album, I put everything in a timeline. And then I started going down the the killing the babies process, as you say, well, I don't need that one. I don't need that one. I don't need that one. Um, I, I, well, now I've forgotten the number, but I'm sure it was north of eight. I think it was around eight and a half hours. Because we were, you know, it's a pretty densely scored show. Um, the music tends to stick around quite a bit. And then how does that compare? I know a film you would like have less duration because a film is shorter, but what about a video game? Because you've done, you did the I've Batman a game. I've done a couple of video games. Um, boy, I haven't done video game for a long time. I mean, I did the Batman Arkham Knight game and I mean, look, it's, the answer is it's a lot less um, for a video game. I mean, oh, wow. even on that, on that, the Arkham Knight, it was two, it was two of us that Nick Arundel, who's the head of audio and myself, I think we did about 90 minutes each. Um, maybe not even that much, 80 minutes each. So yeah, significantly less. Um, and obviously a movie is even less. I mean, I would say if, if you're scoring a two hour movie, if you're unlucky, you might have to write 90 minutes of score. Um, but we live in a, the aesthetics now for, for scoring seem to be a tendency, I think, to slightly overscore things and to keep a musical presence sometimes where it doesn't need to be there. It, of course, it depends on the genre. And I'd say actually, this is, a, the Sandman is a genre where it's, probably more applicable to keep some kind of musical presence because we are in such unusual territory and visual effects and music are two components that can help bring those things to life. But I think sometimes I'm watching drama, which is desperately trying to be realistic. I am not sorry, I'm not talking about this. I'm slightly going off on a riff here, but you watch something which is trying to be realistic and they're actually making some clumsy mistakes in my mind by, by letting the music play just, just doing too much. You kind of think, Shut up for a moment. These actors are okay. Um, the going back to twenty four seven, the diner episode. Um, so that one again, like you said, had, had was so different from the others, and it was one where you were sort of having to create this low rumble. It's so different, but it happens right in the middle of the series. So where in the timeline? did you compose that one? Because it has the fewest of the callbacks to other 
pieces of music in the series. So did you do that one first and then sort of go around it? Or did you do it's like save it for last? I was the second episode. So I didn't didn't score them sequentially because there were some when I started, I think at least the final episode hadn't been shot. And also there were lots of things where they just, you know, the visual effects wise, they, they were just too elemental to send them to me and expect me to respond. So we were very much um, governed by the visual effects timetabling. So that was that was the second one. So basically, I remember I started working on the first one and then moved to episode five, The Diner. But and then and there was a sort of bit of a break between before sort of hearing anything, you know, getting really important feedback. And that kind of happened as I was in the diner. And it meant basically I went back to episode one and started rethinking quite a few things. Um but I think it was good in a way to have the diner up next because it showed me the diversity that was necessary for the show and the fact that, I mean, I'm not I'm not saying that one and five, but that perhaps I could find a, a more diametrically opposed episode. I mean, one could argue five and six are more diametrically uh, opposed, but even one and five, I think, are distinct enough to make me realise to... to to not let me kind of sink into any kind of formula and think this, okay, you crack one, Buckley, now you're good to go. By going on to five, it's like, this is a new beast that you need to, you need to conquer. Um, and you really, yeah, because there is, there is no callback. Well, there's a couple, I said there's no, there's no sort of theme and there isn't really, but there is a little motif for John and the Ruby. And then when I moved on to, episode two and episode three in which I think he him and his mother are both in that there is a little I mean it's it's just a sound a little one-off sound it's a sort of reversed harp um not 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 what I would call it it's clearly not a melodic theme um yeah so five is a kind of probably the most standalone-ish in terms of connective tissue with elsewhere so therefore it was sort of critical at the end of the episode when dream comes, because he's there for the first 15 seconds, but it, it, there's it's but just virtually no time to do anything. And then I think there's a piece of Mozart, I think, or Beta, I can't remember, when we go into the diner. Um, so there's no time really at the front to establish too much. It When he comes in at the end and has his exchange with John, that's where, you know, I was quite, I, I don't know how the mix ended up in the end, but certainly the, the stuff, you know, had a full on massive brass section as he was coming in and it was, it, I scored that big. Is that the scariest thing you've ever scored? Cause I think it might be the creepiest thing I've watched all year. <laughs> um, well that episode, um, it's certainly, it was certainly like an, an eye opening episode. I was thinking, geez, how far are they going to go with this? How far are they going to go? Um, it probably it has to be on the list, yeah. I mean, I've done one, I've done a couple of horror movies, but I think this probably wouldn't take the prize, yeah, yeah. Of all of the characters, I think, especially if we think about episode six, um, but of all the characters within the show, um, which one would you say you enjoyed creating the motif for the most? Hmm. <laughs> Feel like I'm going to be a broken record here, but I the the dream thing just just works for me on 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 so many levels, and I've had really lovely emails about it as well, which I'm that's kind of sort of slightly forcing my hands as well. Um, and then, which character would you most like to meet, since you spent so much time with well, them to make their theme? Well, not death, not just yet. <laughs> I'll give that another couple of decades, I hope. Um, I, that's a really good question. Um, you know, I think desire is quite cool. <laughs> wow, not, not, that's brave. <laughs> <laughs> well, I control I control the musical heartbeat with that with that character, so I can slow it down and turn it up. So <laughs> there's a big metaphor there somewhere. Wow. Um, I read that your <laughs> musical start was as a choir boy. Can you talk a little bit about how that experience um, still shapes the musician you are right now? Well, I think it's given me a, a, a res resilience to be able to cope with the schedules of 
film and television scoring, which I, you know, I wouldn't be the first person to say or the last that it's it's a pretty brutal business and your time isn't your own. I mean, so as a as a child, I was I sang in this cathedral choir and we would we would sing, you know, Christmas Day, we'd be singing Christmas the day after Christmas Day, we'd be singing. So the notion of going home for Christmas wasn't a thing for me for for five years of my childhood which I, I have to say i didn't mind it's not like i was uh traumatized by it i i loved it it was it was effectively like being in a band a very uncool band i might add um and you know going on tour um the camaraderie of of, of your friends um recording television stuff it was i mean it felt very exciting um and it also musically i you know, learnt because you sing every single day, you're just ingesting a fairly specific type of music. I mean, English core music, well, not just English, actually music from the continent as well. And and I think over the years, possibly slightly more eclectic music as well. But it also presented me with um, my first sort of peek into the world of cinematic music, which was that we are the, the, the choir, was enlisted to sing in a, the soundtrack to The Last Temptation of Christ. And it was a real moment from where I felt something. I felt, wow, this is, this is just different. This is unique. This is music working with another art form. And I, I do think that that was probably where it all began for me about age 11, having that experience. I, I think I knew that I had to somehow pursue this. Um, and yeah, I mean, it, it's sort of bizarre, really, that it, it was this fairly quaint provincial cathedral choir, and it sort of somehow that's where my career began, <laughs> age eleven. <laughs> the Sandman, uh, as much ground as the season covers, it only covered a tiny fraction of what is in the comic books. So I'm sure it's going to have another season it's such a big hit musically were you asked to lay any groundwork for anything coming um well first of all let's hope that there is a second season because nothing's a foregone conclusion these days and you know this show is i imagine tremendously expensive to make um but you know i put a, just over a year of my life in it and i i was one of the last people to get involved i mean think of you know neil and David Goyer and, and Alan, you know, those, I mean, it, I just really hope that we can, we can do more. And, and clearly the feedback is, is good. I mean, the critics like it and people do seem to be like, there is a good buzz. So it, you know, it would be nice to, to keep moving forward, but no, I mean, I, I've, and I've, I've never really had that conversation on anything I've done, which where you sense that there could be more to come. There's almost like, just thank Christ we got this far sort of thing. See so deep breath, and then I I will just I will actually the only thing I'm not, no, I'm, I was just exchanging an email with Alan about something or other, and he did mention something that you know if we have a season two, this is something that we'll be talking about. It was it was it was a conversation pertaining to something completely different, and it was just an aside. So clearly there are. <clears throat> I mean I don't know I know that the writers are poised and ready to go. Um, I don't know what you know we'll be tapping into next season. Assuming there is not assuming I'm asked back. Um, so I, I, but you know, I, 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 I wouldn't. I'd love to. I got in early on the first season, but it, it, but time still ran out. I don't really understand it. I mean, it's like I looked at the, the schedule. I thought, wow, you know, compared to like the good fight, which I'm scoring at the moment, I've got, got to do one a week for the next 10 week, weeks, which is an absolute nightmare. This was, this was, this seemed quite luxurious, the schedule. And then, then, and then all of a sudden I thought, where's it all gone? Where's the time gone? Well, I now got to like start moving at a much, much more rapid pace. So I'd love if, if there is, you know, if, if it all plays out nicely and there's a sex season, I'm on it. I'd love to start to understand what, what the components are for, for the next season and where we're going. And, um, what significant new characters there will be and all, and all the rest of it. Um, because I'm sure I, I'm sh I'm sure it's going to be just as rich and textured and nuanced as, as the first season. Um, so even if it's just thoughts percolating around in my head, I'd, I'd rather they were doing, you know, starting to kind of take some control of my 
whatever's left of the old gray matter and um <laughs> and 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 see see what see what might come out the sandman is streaming on netflix now and you can hear that music wherever you stream music and you'll hear some of it on 90.5 wuol classical louisville